All right, we'll call to order the regular meeting of the Common Council of the City of Platteville for Tuesday, October 10th, 2017, and we'll start with roll call. Barbara Doss? Here. Don Francis? Here. Barbara Stockhausen? Here. Ken Killian? Here. Eileen Nichols? Here. Tom Nall? Here. And Catherine Westby has been excused. All right, we're going to start this evening with a special presentation regarding the Coalition for Recreational Trails Award. <coughs> So if uh, the presenters, uh -huh. Howard is going to do the presentation. All right. Yes. But I'm also going to ask uh, Gene Weber and Angie Wright to come up. This is the uh, uh, Coalition for Recreational Trails Award, the Tom Petrie Annual Achievement Award uh, for recognizing the Roundtree Branch Trail uh, in for outstanding use of recreational trail program funds in the category of engaging public sector partners for the year 2017. Um, as most of you may know, Tom Petrie was a, a Wisconsin congressman, so it's especially uh, good that uh, an award gets, come, gets to come back to Wisconsin. The Recreational Trails Funds gets uh, funding through, through the federal government and th through our DNR partners, we received a grant of $45,000 towards the cost of the bridge that's on Valley Road. Um, this trail would not have been possible without our Moving Platteville Outdoors group, uh, represented by Gene Weber. And uh, uh, Angie Wright wrote the original grants and the award recommendation that uh, went forward that they did so it would not have been possible without them and the other partners uh, public private donors everything large and small congressman kind accepted the award on our behalf at a ceremony in washington dc on june 14th and so at this point it's my honor to present this to the common council and to the citizens of platteville and if you had any We just want to remind the council that you folks were the ones that incented that program with a $50,000 challenge match. And we thank you for being an excellent partner in this public-private collaboration. I don't think I have anything to add. I guess I just would also like to thank you. And I guess I hope that this partnership is maybe the beginning of some other partnerships that might happen in the future. Thank both of you very much and everyone else who also contributed. Absolutely. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> All right. Very nice recognition. Next item is consideration of the consent calendar. The following items may be approved on a single motion and vote due to their routine nature or previous discussion. Please indicate to the council president if you would prefer separate discussion and action. Council minutes are in the packet from our September 26th special and regular meeting and also October 3rd special meeting. Payment of bills, also financial report for September. Appointments to boards and commissions, I have none this evening. Licenses, one year and two year operator license to sell or serve alcohol. Also taxi driver license applications are in the packet. And finally a walk permit, family advocates for domestic violence awareness walk, which will be Tuesday, October 17th. Is there a motion? Motion to approve the consent calendar as presented. Second. I have a motion and a second and we'll vote. Doss? Yes. Francis? Yes. Stackhausen? Yes. Killian? Yes. Nichols? Yes. No? Yes. Motion carries. Next would be citizens comments, observations, and petitions. If any, the only request I have tonight is for uh, a subject that we'll be talking about later. So we'll have the uh, person speak then. Reports in our packet include board commission and committee reports, minutes, tourism committee, Francis? Nothing to add. Planning Commission, no, or Nichols? Nothing to add. And I have nothing to add. Housing Authority Board, Killian? No addition. Water and Sewer Commission, Killian, Stockhausen, and no. Nothing to add. No addition. OK. 
Okay, Ms. Yimbord, uh, Westaby, and she is not able to be here to the, this evening. Parks, Forestry, and Recreation Committee, Francis? No addition. And also Westby, is, Westby would be for Community Safe Routes Committee. Other reports in our packet include the City Attorney itemized report for September, the Water and Sewer September financial report, also the Airport financial report for September, and Department Progress reports. Are there any questions or comments on any of those? Seeing none, I'll go on to the first action item we have this evening, which is donation of property west of the dog park on Valley Road. Joe? Okay, yes, yeah, there's a, a larger parcel at 860 East Business Highway 151. It's um, uh, across from Rundy uh, and next to Four Seasons Landscaping. Uh, there's a portion of that land, uh, basically an outlot that was just created uh, on the other side of the stream from the larger property. Um, it's property that is actually adjacent to the dog park property um, where the trail is and the other recreational facilities. Um, due to the location and configuration of that property, it really doesn't have any um, uses. It's not buildable, it's in the floodplain. It's got a you know an unusual shape. Um, so based on its location, the fact that there are recreational features on that property, the, the owners have uh, uh, would like to donate that property to the city. Uh, so obviously we're getting more use out of it as a recreational feature than they will for anything else. So they would uh, like the city to accept that donation. Uh, it's about 0.77 acres. And as I mentioned, it is uh, adjacent to the city owned property already and it does have the trail going uh, across it. So um, this the request did go to the plan commission at their September 11th meeting. They did recommend uh, approval of the donation and staff due to the uh, features of the property and the location would also recommend approval. Any questions? Is anyone? I make a motion we accept the donation of land as uh, described. Second. I have a motion and second to accept the donation of property and we'll vote. Doss? Yes. Francis? Yes. Stackhausen? Yes. Killian? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Nall? Yes. Motion carries. Under information and discussion, city manager proposed 2018 budget. Good evening. Um, I'm going to take a few moments to walk uh, the council through the proposed 2018 budget. I will note that at this point we don't have the line item detail, but uh, we will have that for you by the end of the week. And uh, we can provide that, we will provide that electronically, but we can also provide it to you in hard copy if you prefer. Um, and just to uh, refresh here. And for those of you who are in the uh, room this evening, the presentation is in the back. Um, tonight is just one point in, in what is a long process with respect to our budget. Um, and we started that process with a goal setting session back in August. Um, we had a CIP review session on October 3rd. Um, now I'm presenting uh, the city manager proposed budget. Uh, there'll be additional work sessions during the month of October um, before we actually get to the public hearing um, <coughs> for the budget in, later, in late November. I will note that the budget represents a lot of work by a lot of different players, and I need to call out a few on my staff. Um, Barb Johnson, uh, who is a, kind of the lead budget compiler. Uh, poor Barb has had to do this twice now at a time when the finance department has been understaffed, and it's quite an undertaking to try and do this work in addition to your regular work and the work of another staff member, and we really appreciate her, her efforts. And also Nicola Maurer, our new administration director, who has worked really, really hard to get her arms around our, our budget and has done a fantastic job. And the department heads as well have a major role in this, um, and they too have done a fantastic job of being able to get us good information on a timely basis. So with that, 
I'm just going to go back and do a little review of where we were at a year ago, because I think it's important to remember that. And a year ago, we were talking about what it means to have a sustainable budget. And we looked at that from two perspectives. One we called kind of the bond raiders perspective and the things that they might look at, which included things like having good financial policies, um, not being unduly burdened by debt and have a reasonable path to pay off our debt, uh, making sure that there's enough revenue to cover our ongoing expenses, making sure that there's um, good predictability in, in our ability to capture future revenue, which deals with our local economy, and that we have sufficient cash reserves. I think we're, we're fortunate because we've had two debt issues since uh, we la I last did a budget presentation, and we did maintain our, our bond rating in both of those. And in some part due to some of the steps that we've actually made. Um, so the, the next perspective was actually coming from my, my position as city manager. And uh, as a city manager, um, I want to see, or generally people in my role want to see, that the infrastructure is being maintained in a manner that will maximize its life expectancy, um, that ongoing funding exists to be able to address what are really pretty predictable items that we're going to need in our CIP with respect to equipment and repair of buildings, that debt is being reserved for our large capital uh, projects that have a, an extended life, that there's some level of contingency funds built into our budget for things that we cannot predict, uh, which will inevitably happen, um, and that we're able to pay a market competitive wage to be able to attract and retain talent, and that we're known as a good and stable employer. Oops. And so we've, we've kind of have these challenges, and these challenges aren't necessarily this aspect is not necessarily unique to Platteville. I think um, many municipalities, uh, certainly within Wisconsin and other states, would are, are having the same types of challenges. Uh, we need to maintain, we, we are the caretakers of a lot of, of infrastructure. We have to maintain that infrastructure, whether it's streets, buildings, or equipment that are, that's needed to provide services. Uh, we have the compensation and benefit um, uh, market for, for our employees. And at the same time, we want to be able to do some new adventures, to, new um, initiatives to be able to advance our community because we, we compete. We compete for employers. We compete for, for residents. Um, and, and we want to make sure that we're offering an attractive place for people to settle. And all of this, of course, has to be done in a, a situation where we have constraints with respect to expenditure restraint um, and uh, other mandates. This was a, a slide I didn't put last year's slide on here, um, but this is the 2017 version of a slide that we shared a year ago with respect to our tax revenue distribution. And th I think the thing that's notable, there are two things that are notable about this, especially if you were to compare it to last year's slide. Um, one thing which has been relatively constant, um, at least between those two years, is that about 42 to 43 percent of our budget. Um, comes from the general fund. So um, not, not a lot, not, uh, because we have a large number of TIF, distri TIF districts, um, only 42 to 43% of that revenue is actually coming in to support the general operations of the city. The other thing is with respect to debt service. And this is the 2017 graph. Um, so if you would looked at 2016 graph, our debt service was about 22.5%. And you can see in this graph, it's at 26%. And that was largely behind the challenge that we were facing in 2017, was that escalating debt. Um, and we've obviously, uh, I'll talk about this in a moment, we've taken some steps to address that, that debt situation. So again, just to kind of review, very sensitive uh, clicker tonight. <laughs> Um, kind of where we were at in 2017. I'm not going to walk through this in great detail, um, but we were projecting uh, close to a $200,000 shortfall in our general fund, and that was with no uh, wage increase or money for the CIP. Um, and the primary driver behind that was an increase in our debt service. Um, and then we were also looking at needing to advance TID-6 um, some money because of uh, it did not have the revenues to be able to cover its expenses. When we looked forward, we saw that pattern continuing. It wasn't a one-year deal. Um, we were going to see another jump in our, our debt service in 2018 um, for another additional $60,000. And uh, in TID-6, we were estimating to be about uh, needing about a $250,000 advance. 
um, and again, assuming no wage increases no money towards the CIP. So we knew that we had a significant issue. And just to put that in, back in perspective, a 1% increase in property tax Property taxes nets about $40,000 for the general fund. So those were some really big numbers for us. Um, so the, really the only way forward was to look at decreasing expenses and, and increasing some of our revenues, and, and we did some of both. My goodness. Um, so we had a 5% increase to our levy. Um, that didn't necessarily, that doesn't necessarily translate into a 5% tax increase because of growth in the tax base. Uh, we instituted an ambulance fee. Uh, we had a motor vehicle registration to uh, help, uh, which was a new program that would help uh, raise funds to be able to put forward towards transportation needs specifically. We also proposed some expense reductions that we plan to stage over two years, 2017 and 2018. And you can see the list of reductions there, and I will talk a little bit about where we're at with respect to those reductions in a moment. So now moving on to the progress that we've made in 2017. Um, first of all, we have two new financial tools that we didn't have before. One we've talked about before is our new budget. Um, there's a very different document that I think provides an additional degree of insight and transparency for both the council and for our residents. The second tool is our long-range financial plan, which you, of course, uh, worked through uh, during the sp uh, spring and summer of this year um, that really uh, took a look at our finances out uh, specifically in a five-year period um, and made some specific recommendations moving forward. Um, and so one of the big adjustments that was made as a result of that financial plan was to restructure some of our debt. Um, and we didn't have a simple restructure that we could do, but we were able to do a more complex restructure. And this shows the debt schedule before in terms of um, the escalation um, that existed um, during the course of the next five years, we were looking at debt service that would increase over $500,000, and that was assuming no new debt was added. Oops. After the restructure, you can see that that's flattened out considerably, and now uh, we're looking at um, a debt service increase of about $75,000, which is making our situation much more manageable. Um, next change that um, the council had enacted in 2017 was to eliminate funding for the Roundtree Gallery. Um, based on their new mission, they've sort of restructured their, their governance uh, committee. They have a new exhibition space in the library, which I'm hearing uh, is getting perhaps more uh, uh, traffic than, than the former location. Uh, they have new city, uh, new office space in City Hall for some of their other uh, needs. And we are still holding about $40,000 in binding trust money that at some point could be forwarded to the gallery once they kind of uh, determine their long range plan with respect to space. The Senior Center. The Senior Center, as you're aware, relocated to OE Gray School in September. Uh, the Platteville Area Senior Services, or PASS group, has committed to covering building expenses, which will be rent at the OE Gray. Uh, has raised over $23,000 to date, uh, some of which has been spent towards making modifications to the space. We've received a $15,000 grant from the Eckstein Foundation to cover transportation costs, and we've traded in that limit of a bus for a more functional van that should service us better. For our museums, uh, we've made some adjustments to hours and staffing, and we'll have a, a few additional uh, adjustments as we approach 2018. Um, the museums have received a $25,000 IMLS grant for care of the collections. Uh, they completed a pretty extensive museum assessment program that has made some um, really interesting recommendations for the future, and they have raised over $30,000 to date towards their $50,000 uh, goal. So I really want to acknowledge the work by the staff members that have led these efforts because this was, this was a tough task that they had ahead of them and, they, and, and the citizen committees as well. And everybody has just really stepped up 
and I think really mapped what is actually an exciting future for the gallery, the senior center, and, and our museums. Different, but exciting. And so uh, 2018 proposed budget, the stuff you're really interested in. And so just to remind everybody, uh, we had done a three-year strategic plan and we're in this, uh, 2018 will be the second year of that strategic plan. And as part of that plan, you had identified six themes, uh, business, marketing, connections, housing, uh, employee relations, and fiscal sustainability. Uh, in 2017, we spent a lot of time on fiscal sustainability. Um, but in 2018, hopefully we'll be able to refocus some of our energy. Um, I did want to note that one thing that was an important council goal, but you won't necessarily see in the 2018 budget, was uh, a housing study. And that's because we're anticipating funding that housing study out of the 2017 budget. Oh, my goodness. Can I push it over here? <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Um, so with respect to budget changes, um, there aren't a lot of significant changes um, outside of the reductions we've already discussed um, for the senior center, the museum, and what was already planned for uh, public works streets. Um, as part of the 2017 budget, we had also anticipated that we would make a reduction in one uh, street's position during 2018. So those are plan to move forward. Outside of those planned reductions, there aren't a lot of changes to, to numbers. Um, but we do, uh, we are planning an increase, a uh, wage increase for our employees to start to implement the compensation plan uh, that you had approved in 2016. And so we are proposing a 1% range adjustment um, for our exempt and non-exempt compensation plans. And that employees would move to the next highest step um, or to come on step um, at their anniversary date. Probably the more interesting part of the budget is the proposed CIP, and we had done some work on that, and I had told you that there, were probably, there could potentially be some adjustments after, um, after I finished my work, and there are some adjustments in this list, um, in part due to the fact that we had a little bit more funding to put towards the CIP than what uh, the number I had given you as a team to work with, and also because we've uh, changed uh, how we're going to fund the Legion uh, Field parking lot. So uh, the proposed, what I'm gonna call infrastructure projects, would be the airport ramp resurface and airport fuel farms, and those are being funded through grants and through funds already being held by the airports, so they would not require levy support. Uh, we have three street projects, Pine Street, um, we originally had a different number for this. It was 500,000, but we realized that the water sewer component had not been pulled out. Um, so the correct number is 280,000. Um, then we had Virgin Avenue. And because that Pine Street number was lower than what we had originally projected, we added Lutheran Street for 100,000. And then also the, we are using that mechanism, bond sales, to fund the Legion Field parking lot. Uh, you also see on the list the Mineral Street parking lot, which would be 55,000 from the tax levy, and then 45,000 that's being carried over this year. Hillside Cemetery is proposed to be uh, reconstructed, and that would be $35,000 coming from uh, the trust account for the cemetery. And then Prairie View Soccer Phase 1, which has to do with kind of preparing the field for um, leveling the field. Uh, which would be about $35,000 as well coming from park impact fees. Then the next category is equipment. On the equipment list, uh, the mini pumper truck, which would be a combination of city levy dollars and uh, funds from the townships. A uh, new inspection vehicle, uh, mower for the parks, squad far, car for police, IT, the IT projects um, summarized um, that included a firewall, I think network servers, uh, street sweeper for streets, end loader for streets, a taxi vehicle, and then we put the transit bus on here, but that would, we did not put any city levy support for that, so that would be contingent on having the conversation with the university uh, about them covering the match for the grant. And then lastly, the category that I call other. 
Uh, we have sidewalk repair for $25,000. Street overlays uh, is actually higher than what had been originally proposed um, for a total of $150,000, $30,000 towards street, stri street striping, $10,000 for park signs, $50,000 towards an art hall challenge if we can get a citizen group that would be interested in raising funds for, raising funds for the remainder of what would be needed to replace that building, uh, $7,000 towards uh, bike lane improvements, uh, pickleball courts, uh, which would be entirely funded uh, through private fundraising, a city hall stonework of 15,000, and some city hall interior remodel work for 25,000, which hadn't been on your original CIP list. Just to summarize, uh, the the financing for our CIP, uh, about $405,000 would come from our tax levy. We would pull $472,000 from our general fund unassigned count, and that has been our typical practice. That if our uh, we have that flexibility, that if we're above 20% in our unassigned fund balance, that we can use uh, the remainder uh, towards capital improvement items. We would borrow for um, about 1.2 million and then have over $300 million that would be coming through other sources, whether that's grants or trust accounts um, or park impact fees. Uh, and then that, that total number is actually wrong. I didn't add in the airport there. So it should actually be probably over $5 million. Um, so in accordance with our long range financial plan, we are only borrowing as much as what would be coming off our debt uh, service. So we would not be adding to the overall debt burden of the city. And then as I mentioned earlier, we have a policy that says we have to maintain at least 20% um, uh, for our unassigned fund balance of our general fund expenditures. We are, would actually maintain closer to 25% under the, the proposed budget, but we do think that's a wise choice. One, because we see some variability in that unassigned account, and this might give us flexibility next year when maybe we don't have, have as much to put towards um, towards the CIP, and also because that be, that's another mechanism that we use if we have a, a TID district that needs advances, then we would pull from the unassigned, and that would have, wouldn't necessarily impact our levy. So, uh, and we also think that at maintaining an above, av above 20% in that unassigned fund account is what's helped us to maintain our bond rating, so. Under the proposed budget, um, it would be a 2.5% increase in the general fund uh, levy. The actual impact on taxpayers is gonna be less than 2.5% because there has been growth in our tax, our overall tax base. And so that reduces the amount that any individual taxpayer uh, would feel. Um, we don't have those exact numbers yet, but we will have them for you by the time we do the next presentation. And then lastly, I wanted to talk just a, a little bit about our TID results, because um, we had some really good news and then a really dark, a dark point. <laughs> um, and so overall, we saw increase in, in our TIDs in terms of uh, their equalized values. Um, TID 4, the old industrial park, went up 2%. Um, that, that TID is due to close uh, in a couple of years here, and we're projecting that it will close with a positive balance. Um, TID 6 had an increase of about 7%, and that's a really important TID for us because that's the TID that had required an advance, is requiring advances from the general fund. And then TID 7, which is the downtown district, also had about a 7% uh, growth in its equalized value. The, the dark point was TID 5, which is the Walmart Menards area, and that was impacted by what's called the dark store tax loophole where big box retailers are challenging their tax assessments, saying that they, the tax assessment shouldn't be based on their income, but instead should be as if the store were vacant. And um, Walmart did challenge their tax, their, their tax assessment, their valuation, um, and negotiated a settlement with us. And the negative 7% really is reflecting that, that settlement. 
There is legislation that's been proposed uh, to correct this issue. It's something other states have corrected. Um, and we're really hopeful that the Wisconsin legislature will take action on that. It's got strong bipartisan support, um, but it needs to come to the floor for a vote. So I encourage residents to take a look at that issue and to voice their opinion. And there's a, a link up there for anyone that's interested for more information. And with that, our next meeting will be on October 17th at 6 o'clock. We will likely have that in the police training room. Um, as I said, you'll have your detailed numbers um, by the end of this week. And uh, we will take that opportunity during that meeting for uh, council members to be able to ask detailed questions. Just a question about the dark store issue. Karen, is there information on the platteville.org website also that if people wanted to contact their legislator? Um, we don't have that on our website. Um, I, I could look at posting something or linking to the league's website if that would be helpful. Okay. Any questions, anyone? Yes, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, page seven. New revenue sources, the ambulance fee, is that being raised because the hospital wants more? No, this was what you agreed to last year as part of the 2017 budget. Well, this is new as of 2017. Correct. That was there's a review. No, there's no new as far as 2018. No, no okay. that was a review of the actions that you took in 2017. Okay. I, I have a question. Have we realized uh, the money that we thought we would realize from the motor vehicle registration? Yes, I believe we just looked at that and we were right on target with what we had projected. And I'm just going to see if people are nodding at me. Yes, yes. Since that was a new. Yeah, approximately 11,000 a month. Any other questions? All right. Anything else? No. Okay. Next item for information and discussion, thank you, by the way, Karen, um, is proposed Alliant Energy easement in Knollwood Park. Yes. Thank you. Um, Alliant Energy is looking to uh, supply uh, three-phase three power to the city of Platteville from their substation on uh, Highway 8081 uh, uh, out by... Uh, um, DeLeo machining out there. And so uh, what they want to do is they want to bring power along Highway 8081 down to Business 151 and then connect into the city's grid. Uh, they want to use directional boring techniques to place the wires underground with minimal disturbance. Um, they could use the existing right-of-way, but their, uh, their uh, explanation is that um, it happens to be on a steep slope from the road back down to the bottom of the park, and uh, um, it would be more difficult to directional bore this under proper control. And so they are proposing that we grant them a 10-foot wide easement, uh, basically immediately adjacent to the Highway 8081 right-of-way where the slope is less steep and there would be reduced chance for damage in the park. Uh, uh, using directional boring, uh, it will not damage existing trees, and it would minimize any footprint of, for restoration. Um, so I've got some photos that describe where we're talking about, um, and so we've looked at this, and they are willing to pay for an appropriate amount for this easement, um, their representatives have stated that their appraisers have determined a price of 5000 for the easement um, to uh, continue with good relations with the city. Uh, they were they're offering 7500 and uh, so um, we took this to the Parks, Forestry, and Recreation Committee and the Plan Commission. Uh, they both uh, recommend that the council approve this 10 foot wide easement and that the funds be placed in the parks endowment fund and uh, talking with Luke Peters 
what we have is we've been using, uh, we've been doing a challenge match um, for parks endowment funds. So we would be using that so that we could place a total of $15,000 in the parks endowment fund. And so that's the recommendation of the Parks Forestry Recreation Committee, Plan Commission, and staff that we uh, approve the easement for the offering price uh, and that uh, we match it uh, with an additional 7,500 so that we have 15,000 into the Parks Endowment Fund. Questions, anyone? I have a question. Yep. Howard, there's a um, map, I guess it's a map, that has blue or aqua lines on it in our packet, or at least it's blue or aqua in mine. Yes. So is that blue line where, is that the place where the, is that the, it, there is no explanation of what, okay. the, th what this map is. Okay. Um, or where anything goes on, on this map. Okay. Um, what that, what that is, is that's, um, that's the right of way boundary, which happens to also coincide with the city boundary line, okay. um, along the edge of the park property. And so what we're saying is that that 10 foot easement would be just to the west and or south of that line, paralleling that line. Uh, so it would be approximately between, the easement would be approximately 10, start at 10 feet from the 10 feet and go to 20 feet. I mean, that line, no. it looks to me like has 9.3, 9.8. I'm assuming that's a distance from, I don't know, what it's a distance from. What that what that's supposed to represent is the roughly ten feet. I couldn't get it to to measure exactly ten feet. Uh, I have been doing a little bit more training on that, but that is to show roughly at this scale of this map how how wide this easement will be because that ten foot easement would be immediately adjacent to that blue or aqua line that you're seeing on the map. To the west of it or? To, to west or south, if you will, so yes. So it would start approximately 10 feet from the edge of the road and go to approximately 20 feet is what you're trying to say. Well, it's. From the edge of the road. It's actually farther than that from the actual edge of the pavement uh, I would have to measure that, but that's that's the right of way boundary. That aqua blue line is the right of way, right. and we're just yeah. You're going to start at the boundary line and go farther in. Correct. So if the boundary line is at 9.8, you're going to go from 9.8 to 19.8. Ten the, feet. The that 9.8 is supposed was. What I, my attempt at showing the actual 10 foot line. I'm sorry that it's confusing. It's still confusing. And they have chosen to go on that side of the road instead of the other side for? Well, first off, their substation is on this side of the road. Okay. The second is that uh, along that other side of the road, there's rock outcroppings that they would have to go through and around. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Uh, next item is the former Gates Hotel building demolition or relocation. Yeah, I just wanted to provide a little update on the status of that project. <clears throat> um, as you're already aware, the, the city had the two grants to help with the, the, that project, primarily the site clearance. Um, both grants said that that site clearance work had to be completed by November, and that was creating an issue for the city because um, the efforts to save the Gates Hotel had uh, resulted in some delays to that uh, activity, so we were running up to uh, those deadlines. Um, I did apply for extensions to both of the grants. 
So it'd be a, a site assessment grant from the WEDC and a, a CDBG grant through the Department of Administration. Um, I have not received a final word on that, but I did receive uh, uh, good words from the staff members that they were confident the extensions would be granted. Um, they looked at it as since there are uh, situations that are outside of the city's control and outside of our ability to really forecast that that was happening when we applied for the grants. Um, that was the main consideration for them. If it was just due to us not getting things done for you know other reasons, we were just delayed or not doing things quickly enough, uh, I don't think that would be uh, viewed favorably. But since it was extenuating circumstances, they, uh, they totally understood the situation and realized uh, that we needed some additional time. So uh, we're confident that those extensions will be um, approved. Um, at this point, we still do not have an actual proposal from the developer that's interested in re relocating that building. Um, but the developer, he was waiting for a cost estimate from the mover um, to actually relocate the building and that has been received. So we should be receiving um, a proposal soon. Any questions? Does the council have the uh, cost estimates for moving? Uh, did the council receive that information as far as the cost estimates for moving? We we did not forward that. I, I believe it was one hundred eighty thousand dollars. Yes, that's correct. Um, question, Joe. Um, I know it looks like we we're going to get the funding extension. But if we don't get it for some reason, where are we at? Um, I think the the issue, as I can see it, the the, the issue will be the length of the extension. Um, how long? I, I don't think there's a a risk to not getting it. Um, but the site assessment grant had a deadline of November twenty something and the uh, other grant was November 6, so we still have a little bit of time yet, but I, I think the issue is how long they're gonna give us to do the additional work. Okay, so we haven't started with the first demolition. We're holding off on everything? Correct, right. Other questions, comments? We do have uh, one person who's asked to speak, Gary Perheska. <clears throat> Gary Perheska, 280 Division Street, Platteville, Wisconsin, Platteville citizen and a member of the HPC here in Platteville, Wisconsin. I just wanted to give you an update, everything that was mentioned, I wanna just fill in some of that. Uh, the 28th of September, the Preservation Commission met with the developer and the architect, and also Karen Kurt was there, and that was a real positive meeting. They definitely want to move the building. They were waiting on heritage movers, which you'd heard about. Uh, they were wanted to get a definite as to what could be moved, and the developer broke it down into three types of moves. One would be uh, move the whole building, one was break it into two parts and move it into two separate units, and if they couldn't be moved, he wanted to save just the mansion because of the support walls. So anyway, after that meeting, um, Heritage Movers did come on board and they contacted uh, Adam Johnson on Thursday. He gave me a call, said, can you get them into the building? They happened to be in Platteville and so they came through the building and yes, the building can be moved and it is two separate buildings. There's an airspace in between the two. Uh, the masonry walls are structurally supporting each side. So it can be moved. The whole team measured the entire street. The process to move it, the Water Street uh, lot was not big enough to support the complete structure. So the Mineral Street one was one that everybody was focused on as a possible move. So um, through the engineering department, we were able to get the topo topographic map of that lot that had been transferred to Childs. 
to see what kind of issues they had and also uh, Adam Johnson so they can work on that right away. Now at the 28th of September meeting, they had asked to leave the building stand till they could get the structure in and they had some tentative dates but we didn't know what kind of dates we're, we're gonna be operating under. We had hoped that both the developer and the architect could be here tonight to show you that yes, they are definitely interested. They, the last two projects that they worked on together, they've worked on separate projects also, but the last two projects they worked on together was a million four and a million seven. And they said, yeah, they, we can tell you that that's what they operate under and it's a strike structures that they work on. So anyway, that falls into place. The tax credits were checked and they are available as long as they get their stuff in this year. They have a little bit of time next year to work on it, but to ensure that they get the historic tax credits, they need to, so they are trying to move fairly fast too. So in other words, the estimate came in, I'm not definite, but I think it was the sixth. I received it, I think the ninth or something like that. I received, received the estimate and yes, it was, um, $180,000 to move both structures. So in other words, and to set it on the lot. So anyway, um, I received a communication that they couldn't come tonight, and I think they sent it to Karen also, and Ken and I received it. And um, so I called them up to see if they could possibly confirm that yes, they're gonna be here Thursday so that we can work on some of these details because I know time is the essence of everybody, but I'm really excited that yes, this building can be saved. It looks like everything is falling into place um, on those issues and hopefully we'll have more information and get a more detailed analysis of time schedule and everything by this Thursday. So in other words, the Preservation Com Commission is meeting Thursday and I hope Karen can attend. I I'm not yeah. sure I will be there. Okay, but, but anyway, uh, the state and the feds and everybody else have also shown uh, an excitement that yes, this looks like it can be done. Um, hopefully um, the city can resolve any issues concerning the lot or anything like that that may arise and I'm, I've got faith in you that you'll be able to do that also. But anyway, hopefully Thursday we're gonna have a lot more information because Childs did come up with, yes, it can be moved. And of course that hinged on a lot of stuff. So now that we know it can be moved, there are two separate buildings with an airspace between them, the whole nine yards and the detail route and everything and the topographic maps that we got from the engineering department really have assisted in this to speed things up. So anyway, that's, that's all I've got to say. It's just additional information to fill it out. Thank you very much. Thank you. And maybe if I could add one additional comment. We've, we, we have continuing conversations with uh, General Capital, the developer, um, as we've been working through this process. And it, it's likely that given that we are still working through the potential uh, moving of the, the Gates property, that they will ask for a delay or modification to the development agreement on the closing date. And it's possible that that would be actually advantageous for both them and for the city with respect to some of the environmental capping, so. Questions or comments, anyone? Uh, we, uh, a developer's agreement was mentioned at the last meeting, I think, relative to anyone moving the building, so that's not been discussed any further. Mm -hmm. We're still waiting for more information about actually moving the building? We're, we're waiting for a formal response to our RFP. Okay. <coughs> All right. Uh, next, 2017 city goals quarterly report. And I, I don't necessarily have anything to add beyond the presentation that I made earlier since I covered some of the big topics with respect to the work that we've been doing in 2017, but um, this is just part of the quarterly update that we provide the council. I'm happy to answer any questions. Anybody have any questions on the information? All right, then we'll go into a work session on lead service line replacement update. 